So, okay. All right, so we'll go ahead and sorry, I'm having to redo all of this every time. Um, so if you remember from last time, uh, what we did is we, um, we started an introduction to, to Pandas um, and, and we saw that Pandas deals with, uh, with these things that are called data frames. Um, and these data frames you can kind of think of as being like a spreadsheet, right? Um, but what's really nice about Pandas in, in contrast to, for instance, uh, Google Sheets or Excel, is that you can do some things really quickly like, um, transpose the entire data frame. You can um, relabel the columns. You can tell Pandas which uh, which column, in fact, you want to um, which column, in fact, you you want to use as your index, right? And you can you can use some of Python's existing capabilities to be able to do things like you know strip off. Uh, parts of strings that really don't make any sense and kind of relabel columns and change their data type from a string to a number so that you can use it to plot things, right? And you can do all of that, um, you know, in, in one or two lines of code, right? Just by kind of appending additional operators on, on data frames. Um, the lesson that you all went through on the software carpentry site doesn't necessarily kind of give you a really good sense of of when and where this becomes um, super powerful. So I wanna go through an example today that is admittedly going to be very hydrology focused, but um, I think it will resonate with a lot of other folks that just deal with, with time series data, right? So, um, so we're going to be using a hydrologic time series um, that we're actually going to just download directly from um, directly from the web and, and into, into Python. We're going to install a, a new, um, we're gonna install a, a, a new piece of software using a new library, using a slightly different, um, uh, a slightly different way of, of installing libraries than we have before. So I'll make a couple comments about that. And then once we have that library installed, um, I'm going to, import some of that data and we're going to walk through how we can actually use that data um, use pandas to do some you know fairly um, fairly detailed calculations on that data that you know me as the old school matlab user would have taken like hours and hours to write the code um, in part because you know maybe i'm not the best coder so okay so go ahead and open Jupyter Lab, um, and then you can go ahead and create. Uh, you can create a new folder. Um, you can call this something like Pandas Time Series, and then navigate into that folder. And I'm going to create a new notebook. And I'm going to call this, I'm going to rename it um, Annual Max Analysis. Okay, so. Um, the first thing that we're going to do today is um, we're we're going to install a new library. This new library is is pretty specialized, right? Um, it's called NWIS for the National Water Information System. It's it's written by um, a developer at an NSF funded center at CU Boulder, and really its only job is is to provide a kind of nice Pythonic way of getting data from the USGS's National Water Information System, right? So um, so that's really like all it does. It doesn't do much. Um, and so as such, it's a pretty 
uh, what, what we would call lightweight library, right? And so as such, um, it's not in Anaconda's kind of big library of different libraries that you can install via Conda, right? But it is maintained on kind of another more, a little bit, um, you know, a little bit sort of, uh, I should say in order to get into that Anaconda sort of repository of libraries, you have to pass a whole standards of additional tests to verify that in fact, what you're doing um, adheres to a whole bunch of different standards and it's, a, it's a, a bit of extra work, okay? There's this other repository that's called PyPy, P-Y-P-I, right? Um, that is a, a little bit la more lax with some of its standards. And so there's some additional libraries there, but quite a few of them sort of go unmaintained and you know are can get a little bit stale after a little bit. Okay. So there's a lot of good additional software there, but it's not in the Conda repository, meaning that we have to install it using a different tool. And the tool that we're going to use is called PIP. And I don't know what PIP stands for, but it's probably something like Python installer package or something like that, okay? Okay, but so what we're going to do is that we, we need to actually not tell Python or the Jupyter notebook to do this. We need to tell the underlying operating system, right? The, the, the Unix or Windows system um, that underlies what Jupyter is running on top of. So both Python and Jupyter Notebooks provide this really nice way to actually issue a command and you just precede it with an exclamation point, right? So if I just proceed some, for instance, um, bash user command like ls with the, um, with the exclamation mark. Oh, that's because this is running Windows. So let's see. Okay, so right, the, the command I used is pip, right? Um, and when I when I prepended pip with this exclamation point, what this is telling my notebook to do is to, hey, go out to the operating system and tell it to run this command, right? It's pushing this command down to the underlying operating system, okay? So what we wanna do is, is pip works very similar to um, Anaconda or Git, right? It's formatted as like pip, and then you have to tell it some command, and then that command sort of requires some additional options on top of whatever the command is. In this case, um, what we want to do is we want to install and we want to install NWIS, N-W-I-S, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and run that. Okay. Is it capital? All right, so I can't find NWIS, so I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna see what happened to NWIS. Okay, so All right, so this is good because uh, what this tells me down here is that the NWIS package is now um, is now deprecated. I could still install it from source, but what they've done is they have they have made this new package that's called BMI underscore NWIS for basic model interface implementation of of NWIS. And what it tells me now is that I have to use pip install BMI underscore MWIS, NWIS. Okay, so we'll try that.
Okay. Um, all right, so it didn't flash any warnings or errors, right? It, it showed you that in fact, similar to what Anaconda did, um, it, it went through and it downloaded a whole bunch of additional packages that were required as dependencies. There's one called PyYAML. Um, it, it downloaded and installed NetCDF4 and X-Ray, right? Depending on how you're doing this, or, or what environment you're doing this in, you may have already had some of these dependencies, okay? So was anybody, did anybody get a weird error message when they tried to do this? You got one, Yami, what does it say? Okay. Some of the dependencies, okay. So you could try and install it in a new environment. Now we wanna make an aside here, okay? Because um, what we just did, right? Is we stepped out of the Anaconda ecosystem to use pip, right? So pip is a, a broader command than is available in Anaconda. And, and we went out and we grabbed a package that's, that's not in the Conda repository. Now you will find, Okay, all kinds of scary stories on Stack Overflow about mixing PIP and mixing Conda, okay? Most of the time, like 97% of the time, it's fine, okay? 3% um, of the times something messes up, right? So sometimes what will happen is you use PIP, right? And PIP will install one of these dependencies because it kind of can't figure out that you already have that dependency installed in your Conda environment. And it'll, it'll install a conflicting dependency and it'll break something like NumPy, okay? Okay, so what's a safe way of potential, if we know that we need to use a library that has PIP, but, um, so if we know we have to use a library that's not in Conda, but is available through PIP, then what's a safer way of doing that? Yeah, did you all hear that, what Victoria said? So create a new environment, right? So in Anaconda, right, if you need to use PIP, sometimes you can, you can create a new environment and just use that one library. So that's a totally legit and good use of a Conda environment. Okay, you're kind of walling that off and you're saying, I want to keep this, you know, kind of raccoon from getting into like my other libraries and repositories here. Okay. Okay. All right. So now I have mixed and matched here and that's fine because this environment is going to go away as soon as I log off of this computer. Um, you can always do, um, if you look at the pip command here, you can always do an uninstall, right? If you, um, and you have the option of doing like a full force uninstall, which will unroll all of the changes that, that pip made, okay? Okay, all right, so now that this is installed, we can actually use this library, okay, or this toolbox, and um, again, how do we, again, we now, other than having sort of, you know, done something to the outside of our workshop, we still have a blank workshop. So what is the way that we need to start rolling toolboxes in? Import, right? So we're going to, let's see. And I wanna make sure that I am using Okay, so let's do, so this has changed since I used it. So I'm some, sort of doing some of this on the fly. Import data retrieval. Data dot retrieval, data retrieval, one word. Dot NWIS as NWIS. Okay. 
Okay. All right. And so again, I thought I installed just something called BMI underscore NWIS, right? And, and now it's giving me this data retrieval thing. So what happened in fact is that it installed, right? Like this BMI underscore NWIS actually has a lot of different sort of toolboxes with it, right? So I'm just taking one of the toolboxes that it installed. I'd have to look in the documentation for the software to figure out all of the toolboxes it has. So I've taken this one drawer called NWIS and I've taken that piece of painter's tape, written NWIS on it and slapped it on it, right? It's now in my work box or workspace, okay? All right, so the other things that I'm gonna need besides this NWIS, are pandas as, and usually what we call it is PD. Oops. Import numpy as NP and import mat plot lib dot pi plot as plt okay all right so how many of you have had to go out and get like daily discharges before from the USGS website? Okay, a lot of you. Does, does one of you want to volunteer to say how you've done that in the past? <laughs> What's that? Yeah, so you've had to go to the website, right? Um, it's like water data dot usgs dot gov right and then i need to look for surface water historical observations um and then you know there's all these criteria through which you can search right i can search by site name and i am going to search for uh let's do the Roaring Fork River Okay, so this is a river that's a tributary of the Colorado. Um, I'm just going to leave all of it the, right there's all of these different parameters you can check or not right, so this is one of the huge frustrations of this website is you have to scroll down and I want it to show me well for now like let's just. Uh, table of sites okay. And then we'll be able to pick the one we want. So what I want is the Roaring Fork at Glenwood. Okay, but if I zoom in even more, Roaring Fork at Glenwood is associated with this four digit code, right? Which is its site name now, or this site number. Is this, is this unique? Yeah, this is a unique number, right? So presumably I could just, you know, like if I were to right, want to manifest something into the universe, it might be some library where I could just give USGS gauge IDs and it would spit back for me the data, right? That that I want, right, in a given time range, okay? Now I have to do some, I, I might still have to do some homework. I might need to know that like, well, you know, this is actually good info. This gauge was relocated 700 feet downstream last December, that's good to know. But also some things like, you know, when does the data record start and stop? And so the website is still useful for things like that, right? But other than that, um, as Nate mentioned, I'd have to go, right and and use this right use this website to output 
the information to a CSV file. If you've seen one of those CSV files or in one of those, it's actually like a tab set or fixed width even text file, right? Like it's kind of messy. There's a lot of cleanup that it still needs. There's a lot of header rows that it needs before it's actually like useful in my, um, in my workflow, right? There's a lot of cleaning up that's required, okay? So, so hopefully this package will, will help me with that, right? Will allow me to just in a single Python command actually go and get that data. Okay, so let's see here. Let's, we wanna use this command, get record sites, Okay, so here's just one example. I'm gonna pull this down here, right? I'm gonna do what I usually do, which is okay. So I'm going to say uh, data set equals nwis dot get underscore record. I'm going to tell it sites equals where's my site number? Oh, here it is. Copy. Paste. And then I want to get, let's see, service equals IV. And then start. I'm going to grab uh, 1970, 10, 01, and end, and equals, uh, let's do 2020, 0930, okay. And what I'll do is just, if this is successful, I'll have it print for me what, what it returns, right? I don't know what this thing data set is just yet. I have my suspicions but I'm just gonna print data set just to sort of see what we get, okay? All right, for the non-hydrologists in the room, okay, can a hydrologist or a hydrology adjacent person tell me why I started on October 1st? Jerry. It's the start of the water year, right? So next week is, is the new year for all of us hydrologists, right? Okay. So just doing some quick back of the envelope calculations, right? How many years is this approximately? It's 50-ish, right? Um, how many, if, I, if they're daily values, how many, how many values per year should I get? Three, six, yeah, so 365-ish, 365.25 right, if we're being precise. So how many approximately, and again, order of magnitude here is fine. How many values am I expecting roughly, right? So a good approximation would just be 400 times 50. Yeah. 50, right, like add up, there's three zeros. Yeah, and then four times five is 20. So 20,000 inch, right, no more than 20,000. Okay. All right. So let's do this and see if we're using A, if this works, and B, if we're using the syntax correctly, right? So 
if it works, it will return something. If it, um, if we're using it the way we anticipate we should be using it, it should return something on the order of like less than 20,000 values or a, a something with 20,000 records in it. Okay, so this might take a little while. We're all gonna be sort of hitting the same web page simultaneously. So we might be inadvertently doing a DDoS attack and we might, you all might be excluded from future USGS employment. I apologize. Um, yeah. How consistently telling it too much daily value compared to like hourly value? Yeah, so that's a great question. And, and the key lies in, in this thing right here, right? Um, this might have to be DD to get daily values. Um, IV might be instantaneous. So we might be getting a ton of data. 24 times, 24 times yeah. yeah. Over a million rows. Over a million rows, okay. We really like my, I, the USGS is going to at me big time on Twitter. Okay. Okay. It's, it's still, I'm going to stop. Let's switch this to DV and see if that is in fact better. Oh, okay. You can use the stop button to interrupt it. Okay. Sometimes when a process hangs like really bad, right? And I've done this before, the stop button will not work. And in fact, sometimes you have to shut down, like hard close the tab, right? To actually, which will actually stop the underlying Jupyter kernel. Okay, so just an FYI. Okay, so um, it's returned this whole, this uh, really big, okay. So in this case, 18,000, 18,263 times 15, right? Um, and is that about the right number of rows? Yeah. Um, and it's giving me 15 columns. And if I'm looking at those columns, it is one of these should be Uh, one of these should be, this is the daily mean, zero, 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 six, zero underscore mean. Okay, so that's the daily mean discharge in what units? <laughs> Cubic feet per second, right? Which is not an SI unit, okay. Okay, so with this is, good, right? Like this is actually like a way more straightforward way than downloading that text file and getting it. And conversely, um, one thing that I could do is I could be looking at um, a couple of different sites. Um, you know, so maybe what I want to do is, is include a variable here called site ID. Um, and I'll give you a couple of other numbers here for you all to sort of explore. Okay. So let's create. Um, so a site ID, ID equals 13185000 is the Boise River at Twin Springs. Uh, one three one three nine five one zero is the big wood at Haley. One, three, two, four, six thousand is the North Fork of the Payette near Banks, if anybody's a boater. And then uh, if you want to go out east in the state, uh, 1304 2500 is 
uh, Henry's Fork at near Island Park. Okay. Okay. I'll stick with the Roaring Fork. And um, that's 0908. Five zero zero zero. Okay. Okay. Um, the other thing to note here, right, is that um, what kind of variable is is this site ID? What is its data type? It's a string, right? So, um, what would happen if we had just not passed it as a string. How would Python interpret this? It's probably going to give an error because it doesn't like this leading zero. Okay, but another way that it might interpret it is as an integer, which also would be sort of incorrect, right? So um, this is something that happens uh, somewhat commonly in that, you know, we um, Right, like there's a lot of ID numbers that actually need to be treated as strings when we're talking about them with things like endless. Okay, okay. So maybe at this point, right, you want to try running this other, right? You want to try and and clearing the kernel, clearing the outputs, and rerunning everything to make sure that your workflow is working well. Um, you can do that, but um, if we were to rerun it, what would what would happen with this first cell again? Yeah, it's going to try and reinstall endless. Okay, so we don't need to do that. So, but what I would recommend in this case is commenting this out and, and putting an actual comment in here that says something like need to install BMI endless. Um, if it doesn't exist, okay. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna stick with Roaring Fork. You all can sort of pick a different gauge, right? What I can do now is substitute this site ID here, right? Which would allow me to kind of in principle, rerun this analysis just by changing the site ID, right? In in another workflow, right? Um, I could also create variable names that denote different start and end dates if I wanted, right? I could say something like start date equals this. I copied over it, okay. Uh, 1970, 10, 01. Okay, and then I have to remember to include this here. And then the same with N. Call this end date. Okay. All right. So just to make sure that to verify my workflow is is clean, right? I'm going to go ahead and go up to kernel. Um, and I'm going to say restart kernel and run all cells. Okay. And it's going to say, do you really want to do this? And I'm going to say yes. Okay. Okay, so um, what I really want to know now, right, is is what what did what did this so okay, 
maybe I've convinced you that we're at least, you know, we're maybe one step ahead here by not having to do all of our, all of that cleanup, right? And being able, how many of you actually were able to rerun this with a different, with one of these different sites? Okay, all right. So, and, and, and more than that, right? We were able to just switch a variable name and rerun it and get a different site's data, okay? Um, so we're a little bit ahead, but now like what, what do we have here, right? What is this thing? Um, what is this data set that I got back? And is it a, a pandas data frame? And if not, how do I get it to a data frame? Okay. So um, there's a couple of different ways that you can do this. Uh, you could do print data set and it should, That's not giving us the metadata. Let's see. Let's see if we could do dataset d type. Let's do data set, data set, dot, and then tab. And then let's see what options it brings up. Okay, so. Let's see. All right. What I'm looking for here is okay. So what I'm wondering here, right? Why I'm pausing is um, I'm wondering if this is actually an X-ray data set. Or if this is an actual, if this is a, a data frame, what happened? Okay. Okay. So, oh, type. Like this, or do I, no, in friends? Oops. Type. Okay, so this is a data frame. So we're good. Okay. Okay, what I was worried is that it was an actual, the, the previous version of NWIS returned what's called an X-ray data set, which we'll get to in a couple of weeks, but it's just basically like a multi-dimensional data frame, right? It's really good for stacked images or bunches of net CDF files. So we're good. So we're, we have an actual pandas data frame here. Okay. Now, um, well, the first thing that I want to do, right, is maybe plot this time series to see if it sort of even, even makes sense, right? So if you went through at the end of last class, and if you went through the rest of that software carpentry lesson, how did you just plot something from this data frame? Do you remember? Yep, so we did something like data set, and then we had to tell it the variable name, right? And in this case, oops, that was going to be, this thing here, which we could just copy. It's a weird name. This is a weird name for a variable, but this comes from the 
USGS website, right? So I could just do that. And then how did I, what did I do? I just did pl plot, right? Dot plot. I called the plotting function for pandas and Okay, so not only did it give me a plot, okay, um, but what do you notice about the x-axis? It's a, it's a date, right? And it got it correctly, right? Like I didn't have to do any like fancy manipulation of my x-axis, right? It, it just naturally knew but I didn't naturally know, right? My index here is this thing called date time, which is a, a very, it's a special derived data type, right? Meaning it's it's not an integer, it's not a float, it's not a string. It's, it's something that actually acknowledges that there is this notion of things called time. And this is my index variable, right? So you can see here that it's effectively kind of midnight, right, on, uh, October 1st of 1970, um, and I'm getting the daily mean, right? So I'm, I don't know quite if, if midnight, right? That's the beginning of October 1st, not the end of it. So I have to think about how, right? I have to be a little careful and is this like a forward, like is my average the average over all of October 1st and is this the right actual time? In this case, it doesn't actually matter that much just because we have only daily values, right? If they were hourly, we would have to be a little bit more careful or if we were concerned about the time zone, right? If you wanted to know like, you know, did this, what was the, what was the daily value for like a flood event that happened in the middle of the night, right? That would be one case where we'd have to be a little bit careful, okay? But so that date time object, which um, we'll get into some more, we're gonna use date time objects a lot, but it's gonna allow us to do some, you know, pretty remarkable things with, with our data set, okay? So, all right, so does this look like about 50 years of flow? It's kind of compressed, right? Because, but I, it looks here like I have, you know, something like 50-ish peaks. Some are as low as 2,000. Some are as high as like 11,000. It looks like it goes from 1970 to 2020. I have highs. I have lows, right? Lots of variability. I would expect that on the Roaring Fork of the Colorado. There's no zero val values. There's no obvious big data gaps, which is one of the other reasons to just kind of quickly do a plot like this. Okay. All right. Now, what I would like to do as a hydrologist now is I would like to go and find the actual values of these maxima, right? I want to go off and pick the pick the underlying values of, of my maximums, right? I want to get my so-called annual maximum series, okay? Why do I want to do that? Any of my, what are some kind of things that we can do with that annual maximum series? Anybody know? Yeah, right, I can, I can see how, right, what is, I can ask questions like, Right, what is the value of flow that is uh, not exceeded on average once in every 20 years or five years, right? I can get at things like what is my five year flood? What is my 10 year flood, right? Okay, so if I wanted to go through and get my annual maximum series, get the annual maxes, how might I do that? So if somebody is a, a savvy MATLAB user, could you comment on how you might do this in MATLAB? Yeah, 
But if you want it for every year, what do you, what do you, so you're going to use a max function. Okay. What else do I have to couple that with? I have to do a for loop and, and loop through each year, right? And, and that's, I think I can write like, I, I think that there's a way to just grab like all of the year equal to 1970, right? But it still involves me writing a for loop, okay? All right, so this is where things um, with pandas get uh, super, super slick, okay? And we're going to use this really powerful function called group by. Okay. So I'm going to say um, data set dot group by. And I'm totally going to mess this up. So I'm going to have to iterate in, in how I find this, but I want it to group date time, right, which is my index variable. Okay, I want to group this date time index variable by what? Equal year. All right, let's try that. This might not work. All right, now I'm reverting to Google. Uh, data frame and S group by year. Okay, so at a minimum, what I need to do is Tell it to group my discharge variable. Okay, still doesn't like that. Okay, now let's see. Maybe there's Grouping data by year. Oh. Okay, let's try this. Okay, this returned something. I don't know what it returned. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is, so it, it returned this thing called a group by object, a series group by, but it returned something, right? And it has some weird address here. So, well, maybe what I need to do is just store this Um, in a new data frame, I'm going to call this df uh, year, and I'll print out what it returns. It returns the same thing. Okay. Well, what it's returning, right, is is um, what it's actually returning is is not so much an object as it is kind of a sequence of relationships, right? So it's returning some kind of derived object that says, here's how I would go and get these individual years if you tell me to do something more specific with them, right? If you tell me to go and, you know, find the, the mean of a year, 
this kind of grouper object is going to go is going is is how I'm going to go and map and and get these these years. Okay, so what might be the operation that we want to tell pandas to perform on this group? So somebody's saying mean, what else could I do? That's a good, that's good line of thinking. We want the annual maximum series. Let's try max, okay? So, and then how did we append commands in Python or in pandas with a pandas object? It's, yeah, so like, let's try dot max. And I'm gonna, this is a function, so I'm gonna use open paren, close paren. And lo and behold, right, it's given me an object that has date, time, and these annual maximum values, right? What's another way I could try to like visualize, right? These are the numbers in, in a table. I could print, what else could I try? Let's, yeah, plot. Ooh, that was cool, right? Maybe I could have also, in fact, uh, Maybe I, I could have skipped a step. Maybe I could just, would that have worked? Yeah, right. So I can just start appending a bunch of these kind of commands, right? Um, and these are, you know, these are also sequential, right? So I could have done something like, um, for, for every year, or let's see, I'm thinking off, off the top of my head here, right? But, um, what if I wanted to take, uh, the, the average discharge for every month and then I wanted to get um, I wanted to compute the maximum month of discharge for every year, right? Or the maximum monthly discharge in any given year. Right? I, I would have then grouped by month, right? In this step here instead of year. And then I would have taken the average. And then what would I have done? I I do another group by right, and I just group by the year then, and then I would take the max right, and that would just be a sequence of dot now do this dot now do this right, and so therein kind of lies a lot of the power of of pandas right, and again for those of you that are have all at all seen any R? R is very good with this too. Is that fair? Yeah. In fact, I think it's called group by. Yeah. Okay. So the backstory of Pandas is that Pandas is a MATLAB or a, a, a Python library that is is meant to kind of mimic some of the some of those features with R. Right. Now, what's nice about this too is that this was a lot of times when you go through these, um, right, when we go through these data analysis routines, right, when you're sitting in your cube on a Friday afternoon wishing that you weren't in your cube, right, a lot of times you're going through this in sort of an interactive way, right? You don't know what the code you should be writing looks like. And so you're kind of literally talking yourself through, okay, now I want to take the, I want to group by months, and then I want to take 
the mean, and then I want to group by years, and then I want to take the max of that, right? So Pandas is really good for these kind of interactive steps where, where we're trying to kind of do several steps in our analysis, but we know we have a bunch of tools at our disposal to be able to do that, right? And so all of this, this was literally one line of code to get my annual maximum series. The first time I did this in Pandas, I about cried because I thought about how much time I had lost writing for loops, right? So, um, so what's nice about that, right, is that now we could actually like, you know, if I wanted to, I could take this data, I could export it as just a regular NumPy array. I could fit all kinds of, I could sort it, right, um, from, you know, high to low. In fact, maybe instead of max, let's do a sort. See if that does anything. No, nope. all right. Series has no object called sort, sad. Okay, so I'd have to do something else, okay. Um, but I could I could export this and, and do all kinds. Of, I have the 50 points of data from that 18,000 that I actually needed, right? And moreover, if I wanted to do this for another site, right? Now let's do this for Boise River at Twin, okay? Um, I'm just gonna go to kernel. I'm gonna restart kernel and run all cells. And it's different, right? It just processed a whole different river without actually having to go download and process my files. Okay. Okay. So the, the problem set for using Pandas is going to be um, basically taking what we've already done here and actually doing an, an analysis. And I'll, I'll, I'll give you kind of the commands that you need um, to, to run through, I'm, I'm not going to tell you the order in which you need to use them, but I'll say, hey, look at this command. Hey, look at this command. Um, to actually compute a, a, I think, 100 year flood, it's a little bit of an extrapolation, um, which for the non hydrologists in the crowd, you're going to start driving over bridges and realizing that they're built to withstand 100 year floods when there's only 30 years of data. And that'll, that'll be a little bit of a, head scratcher, right? Um, but I think, and I hope that what you start to see is that regardless of the specific application, right, whether it's analyzing infrasound time series or whether it's um, analyzing seismic data or whether it's analyzing temperature data or, right, whatever, wherever we have some kind of like continuous time series, or even, even if it's not continuous, right, if it's annual census data of a specific species, right, if it's, you know, density, vegetation density for a certain number of plots, right, a, a lot of what we do is kind of this kind of analysis, right, where we want our data grouped in different ways, we want different statistics on those groups, and then we want to group it slightly differently and compute something else. Okay. Okay. Before leaving, what questions do you all have? Okay. Um, oh, yeah. No class this Thursday. Uh, I'm traveling. And so I'll see you all on Tuesday, all right? Okay, all right. Um, I'll give you back six minutes of your time. Yeah. That's a good question. Um, so this has a plural of sites. And I wonder, I wonder if that means I can pass a vector of these sites. So let's do Boise and Big Wood River. There's probably some good reasons to look at them both simultaneously. So I'm going to restart the kernel and just uh, 
clear all outputs. So we'll run this and then this. And then let's see. Okay, so now we have two sites. So I bet um, if we did, let's just try this. Multi-index, okay, so. I think I would have to, let's see, data set dot index. What does that give me? Uh, what if I do, can I group by two things? This is where I revert to Google. Pandas group multi index. And here is a Yeah. I was just wondering if, like, once we add that, like, anti max, yeah. if we could just if we can overlay. That. Yeah. So the like quickest way to do that, right, is I mean, the way without without learning how to deal with multi in indexes is to um, just save one as like a NumPy series and then do that same like right. Just create two data sets, okay. right? Um, but it does look like it wouldn't let me do like a plot plot in the same. Yeah, band. yeah. So I was wondering if there was like an online plot style to be. So by default, you can give um, like on. Yeah. So if you give if you give the panda, so if you give matplotlib, and we'll go through like some more specifics of using matplotlib. If you just use matplotlib, you you can give it like basically like a, a matrix of like. Well, you can give it an X and then you give it an, a matrix that has like um, the same number of rows and then like several columns. By default, it, it plots all of them. And then when you type dot legend, it will show you like, yeah, I was thinking in like MATLAB, you just pull it on. Yeah, yeah. You could just start overlaying all of these. Yeah. Things. So, um, and then the other thing in MATLAB is you don't have to use, there's no like hold on. So you, if you were to just do like a, um, like a plot after that, it would by default overlay them. So, yeah, yeah, yep. Um, Ryan, um, so if you wanted to pull up this year and like visualize it, like yeah, if you want to look at 1978. Yes, is there a way to do that? Because I was testing like the hard brackets and then like zero to get 1970. Yeah, I was not liking that. You but can like the name like 1970 with the quotes. Yeah, you would use um I think within let me go back. I I think that within the let me go through and just use this and then I think um 
let's just get that one. I think it's iLoke. Oh. So I think it's like um, iLoke. Yeah, so I look and then um, so I look is index, right? Yep. So it might be just um, so you're doing it before you do the group. Five. Yes. So yeah. You can't do it after you do the group five. Uh, so be nice. Oh, 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 yeah, you can. Yeah, okay. you can. You um, so it just is a matter of like what this when we do that group group by yeah um and then so you're saying like you want like i want to know the max in like 1970 or like i want to know well it'd be nice if i could not even before doing the max if i could group it by something and then and then plot the years you do you do have to be careful so you, when you do that you have to like do a little bit of puffery with just making sure that the index is actually reset when you're regrouping yeah. It's called, like, otherwise if you don't do that you work the same you have to but that's yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I I group by a name for for some of the plotting I do. I group by a name. Yep. And then I like to check to make sure that they look good and that like everything's where it is. It'd be nice to have a data frame that I can oh, check yeah. and make sure everything yeah. looks good. Yeah. For, like the group that has a certain name. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So you can. So there's a couple of things you could do. You could do this thing with the um, multi in indices, right? And like you could create another index that's like your just your years. Yeah. And in fact, that's what. So the thing here is that 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 group by gives you 51. We didn't. What we didn't do is create another actual water year to group by. Yeah. So we have like a January or a, we have right now in October. We have an extra like three months. Okay. Um, and then an extra nine months. Yeah. Um. And so you can create another index variable to group by. Um, okay. And then, you know, if you, so yeah, so basically like when you use group by what it's giving you, I didn't get into this. We will, when we talk about x-rays, it's actually giving you what's called the task graph. And it's saying like, here's how the indices relate to like that year. Yeah. Um, and so basically all you have to do is you just, what you, what you want to do is like trim basically like, Mm. one of those years and like plot it right okay um, and so there's a there's probably several different ways to do it but it's a good question let me like do a little digging and then okay yeah cool so thanks so much okay, yeah do you have a minute or i i probably do you okay yeah yeah um yeah the first is i'm trying to like i have a bunch of kind of unix or like linux lines for some of the cluster servers that I have to run every time. Yep. I can't figure out how to like put that in a single wow. script. Okay. Like what format that I need to do that in? Um, um, it's and you're running it on like a cluster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you just need to create a simple bash script. Okay. So I, I like ninety percent sure I've tried that, and it just tells me that like none of the commands are applicable. Okay. It's very weird. It send me like either email, yeah, and then yeah, yeah. we could talk about it. So there's a couple of things. You may not have like the shebang at the beginning of the bash script. So that you need um, uh, so you need this stupid yeah. thing here, right? Which basically says like this that is a might, bash shell. Yeah. I'll the other thing is I put in for a job at NREL and or no, sorry, not NREL, PNNL. Oh yeah. And HP said you might know somebody yeah. who works up there. Can we like yeah, for sure. Show that? me, send me like the um the posting. Yeah, the posting, yeah. and I could tell you like if if there's somebody if in that like yeah, sure area that I know. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Hi, I'm going to be gone next week. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'll be better about posting the, um, I just stopped recording. So this isn't recorded. Um, I'll be better about, uh, posting the, um,